Kata yang mana? So very good morning to one and all watching this webinar today. So the topic for today is groin hernia, open and laparoscopic anatomy. This session is moderated by Dr. Bansal sir. Coming to the relevance of anatomy in inguinal hernia repairs. To quote Henry Frouchard way back in the 1500s, he remarked, a healthy man is unknown to himself a hernia bearer such as the commonness of inguinal hernia in men. About 20 million groin hernia repairs happen annually worldwide. Yet, we have seen in major RCTs, there is a risk of about 10% of recurrence following inguinal hernia repair, which is why it is very important to be well versed with the anatomy and physiology of inguinal hernia. Three important things that we have to keep in mind is to ensure a tissue protective dissection such that we ensure the patient an early return to normal activity and minimize the risk of recurrence. An introduction to hernia. So the etymology, it has been derived from the Greek word meaning offshoot or bulge and the Latin word meaning rupture. To define a hernia as we have classically been seeing is an abnormal protrusion of an organ or tissue through a defect in its surrounding walls. Beside, we can see the picture, probably the first taken picture of a patient of groin hernia. We can see a massive inguinous scrotal hernia, which was taken way back in the 1500s. Before delving into the anatomy of hernia, a brief outline on the anatomical and surgical history of inguinal hernia. The first recorded description of hernia dates back to 1500 BC by Ebers Papyrus. Later, we found Gallen in 200 AD hypothesizing that hernia occurs due to the rupture of the peritoneum and aponeurotic muscles, which was later disproved by Frederick Ruiz in the 17th century that it is not due to a rupture of the peritoneum, but it can be through a defect or it can be a weakness in the abdominal wall that gives rise to a hernia. Celsus maintained a record of the hernia operations happening way back then. Scarpa in the 18th century was the first to describe a sliding hernia. We know a sliding hernia is one in which a component, uh, a wall of the sac is formed by the peritoneum covering a retroperitoneal organ, which is commonly the bladder or colon. He was the first to describe the inguinal ligament. And so even the deep layer of superficial fascia, as we popularly know, Scarpa's fascia has been named after him. Lawrence Heitzer was the first to describe a direct inguinal hernia in the 17th century. Peter Camper was the first to describe processus vaginalis, an important structure in the embryology of inguinal hernia. And so the superficial layer of the superficial fascia of the interior abdominal wall has been named after Camper. Sir Astley Paston Cooper was the first to describe the transversalis fascia, the climastric fascia in the 18th century. Jules Clockett described the iliopubic tract uh, soon following Cooper's discovery of the transversalis fascia. John Gay was the first to describe the femoral sheath and femoral canal again in the 1800s. Bassini brought about a revolution in the hernia, inguinal hernia repairs by being the first to understand that it is by reconstruction of the normal inguinal region anatomy that we can ensure a good hernia repair. He was the first to have reconstructed the inguinal canal. He is popularly known as the father of modern herniography. The proponents of the preperitoneal approach of hernia repair were Nihas, Condon, and Harkins. This preperitoneal approach were considered more anatomic as we can see the transversalis fascia better in this manner and so also the defects through which the hernia occurs. McVeigh was the first to describe the Cooper's ligament repaired in the 1940s. Later, we have Reeves and Stopa, the proponents of, again, the preperitoneal approach. And Reeves used a Merselin mesh for the preperitoneal mesh repair, while Stopa used a Dacron mesh. 
The advantages of uh, doing a preperitoneal mesh repair being there is no tension because there is a mesh that is covering or anchoring the entire peritoneum in situ and there are no sutures that is required. Lichtenstein brought forth the tension-free mesh hernioplasty in 1986. The first lap herniography was conducted in 1982 by Ralph Kerr. Now we know very popular concepts of triangle of doom and triangle of pain which were first given by Spohr et al. McConnell and Laws were the first to perform a TEP in the year 1993. The three pictures of the three famous surgeons Eduardo Bassini, Earl Shoulders and Ralph Kerr in sequence. Coming to the embryology which forms the basis of any anatomy. As we know, the gonads develop in the posterior abdominal wall at the level of L1. The inguinal canal is the one that provides a pathway for the descent of the testis, which occurs during the 7th to 8th months of intrauterine life. Now, what is a gubernaculum? The gubernaculum is the caudal genital ligament that anchors the gonad to later we'll see the labial scrotal swellings which will develop into either the labia majors or the scrotum. Now, as the mesonephron degenerates, it's a gubernaculum that descends from the lower pole of the gonads till the labioscrotal swellings. Now, as the gonad follows the gubernaculum into the labioscrotal swelling, we get evagination of the peritoneum, which is the processus vaginalis that develops ventral to the gubernaculum. And this processus carries with itself extensions of layers of abdominal wall. All the three layers of abdominal wall, as we will see, three layers basically, the internal spermatic fascia, uh, the chromastic fascia and the external spermatic fascia all derived from the three layers of the anterior abdominal wall which you're going to see later and these will form the coverings of the spermatic cord and the testis. Now this process is vaginalis is normally expected to degenerate between 36 to 40th weeks of life that is before or soon after birth. But if this process vaginalis remains patent, it will provide the pathway for an indirect inguinal hernia to develop. Now, as I just said, the internal spermatic fascia, the innermost layer, is derived from the fascia transosalis. The chromastic fascia is derived from the chromaster muscle or the internal oblique muscle, and the external spermatic fascia is derived from the external oblique epineurysis. This is just a pictorial depiction of the embryology that I just mentioned here. We can see the testis, which is developing in the posterior abdominal wall. This is the caudal genital ligament, and at the caudal end of it is the gubernaculum. The caudal genital ligament regresses, and it is just the gubernaculum, which is anchoring the testis, and is as it is descending down into the labioscrotal swelling. And anterior to it, we see the processus vaginalis, which is developed as an evagination of the peritoneum. Now, as we see, there is a narrowing of this processus vaginalis and it is supposed to obliterate at around 36 to 40 weeks of life and as it obliterates the remnant processus vaginalis becomes the tunica vaginalis of testis but if this does not happen that is how we get an indirect inguinal hernia. Now the spermatic cord we have already discussed the layers to dis discuss the contents primary content is the ductus deferens or the vas deferens with the process vaginalis forming the tonica vaginalis and the testis, the chromastric muscle fibers. Then among the vessels, we have three vessels major, one being the testicular vessels or the gonadal vessels, then the artery to the vas deferens and the chromastric vessels. And among the nerves, we have the genital branch of genitofemoral nerve. And accompanying these arteries is a very important pampaniform plexus of veins. Coming to the epidemiology of abdominal wall hernia, which can be groin hernia or inguinal hernia, which comprises the major chunk of abdominal wall hernia, 70 to 75%. Then the ventral hernias. Ventral hernia can be an umbilical hernia, 15% of the total, followed by the incisional hernia, 9%, and epigastric hernia, 7%. We also have a pelvic hernia and posterior hernia. The hernia can be broadly divided into three types, the external hernia, internal hernia and the interparietal hernia. External hernia refers to that which occurs through all layers of the abdominal wall. The internal hernia, it is a protrusion through a defect within the peritoneal cavity. 
for example, a paraduodenal hernia or the very uh, popular Peterson defect that we see following a Roux and Y gastric bypass through which internal hernia can occur uh, alongside the colon. Then we have the interparietal hernia where there is a sac that is contained within the muscular aponeuritic layer of the abdominal wall. The inguinal hernia types, the score for today is about inguinal hernia and the two major types are direct and indirect. As we can see in the picture, a direct hernia is one which occurs due to a weakness in the anterior abdominal wall musculature. But the deep ring and the superficial ring, they are all patent. We do not see any herniation along the inguinal canal. Rather, we see a defect in the anterior abdominal wall musculature through which there is a protrusion of the peritoneal content. Now, an indirect hernia in which there is a patellus deep ring or a patent processus vaginalis through which there is a herniation of the peritoneal content. And we have a pantalone hernia. A pantalone hernia is a combination of both direct and indirect hernia. Now, as you've already discussed, inguinal hernias form 70% of the abdominal wall hernias more common in males, 9 is to 1 ratio. Now, lifetime risk of developing hernia in males is 15% while 5% in females and the ratio of indirect to direct hernia is 2 is to 1. Femoral hernia comprise 3% of all inguinal hernias and we see femoral hernia being 10 times commoner in females as compared to males. However, in a female, the most common hernia that we see is an inguinal hernia. But if we only talk of femoral hernia, it is common in females. The complications of hernia are more prevalent at extremes of age. Coming to the site predominance, we often see a right-sided hernia rather than a left-sided. Now, in case of inguinal hernia, this is it has been hypothesized that there is a slower descent to the right testis, which causes a delayed atrophy of the tunica vaginalis, giving more scope for a hernia to occur. While in case of a femoral hernia, we're talking of a protective factor on the left side, which is the tamponading effect of sigmoid colon, which is why we do not see a hernia of the left side as often as we see a hernia of the right side, as there are no protective factors on the right. Hernia classification systems. Any classification system is necessary to ensure uniformity in the understanding of the pathophysiology, the management, and also in review of literature. So in hernia, we have seen there is no particular classification which has served all the purposes because of the wide variety of the operated techniques that are performed for a hernia. However, to enlist the classification systems, we have the Gilbert classification, the Nehas classification, the Agen classification, and the European Hernia Society classification, which is a modification of the Agen classification. Coming to the Gilbert classification, it is based on three things. One, the presence, absence of the peritoneal sac. Two, the size of the deep inguinal ring. And three, the integrity of the posterior wall. Now, type 1, 2, and 3 in Gilbert classification refer to indirect inguinal hernias. Type 4 and 5 are direct hernias. Type 6 and 7, as we'll discuss, are modifications of the Gilbert classification by Robbins where type 6 is a pantaloon hernia, which is a combination direct and indirect, and type 7 is the femoral hernia. To discuss the type 1, 2, and 3 in detail, type 1 is one where the deep inguinal ring is less than one finger breadth in size, and the posterior wall is intact. Type 2 is one where the deep inguinal ring is just about one finger breadth, and the posterior wall is still intact. But in type 3, it is an indirect hernia, but a part of the posterior wall has broken down and the deep inguinal ring is also patellus, being two finger breadths or wider. Type 4 is one where the deep inguinal ring is intact, but there is a full breakdown of the posterior wall. While type 5 is one where the deep inguinal ring is intact, however, the posterior wall has not fully break, broken down, but there is a defect through in the fascia transversalis through which the direct hernia is occurring. The Neha's classification. In Neha's classification, the type 1 refers to indirect inguinal hernia where we have a normal or patent internal inguinal ring. More example is a pediatric hernia. In type 2 is an indirect inguinal hernia where the internal inguinal ring is dilated but the posterior wall is intact. That is the deep epigastric vessels, they are not uh, displaced. Type 3 is one where we encounter a posterior wall defect. 
it has three subtypes a b and c where a is a direct hernia b is an indirect hernia where there is a dilated internal inguinal ring in addition to the posterior wall defect and c is a femoral hernia and type 4 stands for all recurrent hernias a b c d standing for direct indirect femoral and combined respectively now this is a european hernia society classification where l m and f they stand for lateral medial and femoral zero no defect one two and three refers to the size of the finger breadth like admitting one finger breadth two finger breadths or three finger breadths where each finger breadth is approximately 1.5 centimeters and here we have separate columns for primary and recurrent hernias coming to the anterior to posterior anatomy of the abdominal wall the first layer as we know is the skin and subcutaneous tissue which if reflected we find the tributaries of the great saphenous vein <clears throat> which are the superficial circumflex celiac vein, the superficial epigastric and superficial external pudendal vein followed by the external oblique muscle and aponeurosis, middle layer being the internal oblique muscle and aponeurosis and the innermost being the transversus abdominis muscle with aponeurosis and deep to it lies the transversalis fascia further deeper is the preperitoneal tissue and the parietal peritoneum now this is a pictorial depiction of the layers we just described as we see here this is the external oblique aponeurosis uh, which is arising from the lowermost fibers of the external oblique muscle the middle layer being the internal oblique muscle with its aponeurosis and the innermost being the transversus abdominis with its aponeurosis and deep with the transversus abdominis here we see the fascia transversalis and further deeper is the preperitoneal tissue and the parietal peritoneum here we can see this is an opening in the external oblique aponeurosis which is a superficial ring through which we can see the cord structures arising the spermatic cord with all its structures arising from the external inguinal ring now this is a very famous diagram the Neha's classical parasagittal diagram which shows the anatomy of the right groin just to reinforce this is the anterior most layer on the external oblique muscle with its aponeurosis here we see there is the upturning of the inferior edge of the external oblique aponeurosis forming the inguinal ligament and this is the inguinal canal through which we see the spermatic cord the second layer being the internal oblique muscle and the innermost is the transversus abdominis here we see the fascia transversalis it has two lamina and between the two lamina of the fascia transversalis we have the inferior epigastric vessels and this we see is the deep inguinal ring through which the cord structures enter the inguinal canal. Coming to the muscles of the interior abdominal wall, since we are discussing anatomy, a brief word in it. External oblique is the outermost muscle layer. Its fibers are directed inferior medially and an easy way to remember is hands in pockets. And this external oblique muscle it arises from uh, it arises as eight digitations from the lowermost eight ribs and it is inserted into the iliac crest the pectin pubis and the pubic symphysis the superficial inguinal ring is an opening that like of the external oblique aponeurosis which lies above and medial to the pubic tubercle this is the internal oblique muscle which is the in mid mid middle layer and its fibers are directed superior laterally which means it takes its origin inferiorly that is from the pectin pubis and the inguinal ligament and it goes superiorly to insert into the linea alba as an aponeurosis and into the costal cartilages of 10 to 12 ribs then we have the transversus abdominis which is mostly horizontal it is directed slightly oblique downwards in the inguinal region then we have the conjoint tendon which is a very important structure in the inguinal region it is formed by the inferior and the medialmost fibers of the aponeurosis of internal oblique and transversus abdominis this is present in about 5 to 10 percent of the population and this structure is most evident at the pubic tubercle as we see in this diagram it is a diagram of cadaveric dissection where we see this is the conjoint tendon most prominent in the region of insertion in the pubic tubercle arising from the medial most and inferior most fibers of external oblique and 
uh, of internal oblique and transversus abdominis. This is the fascia transversalis which is lying deep to the anterior abdominal musculature. It is a connected tissue layer and it will form the endo-abdominal fascia and the endopelvic fascia. It is a bilaminar structure. It has got an anterior thick layer which is very vascular and a posterior thin layer which is relatively avascular. Between these two lamina lie the inferior epigastric vessels. Now, this transversalis fascia has an oval opening which, which is the internal inguinal ring or the deep inguinal ring and on either side of the deep inguinal ring are the two crusts of the fascia transversalis because this is the region where it is thickened and we have an anterior longer crust which is attached to the transversus abdominis muscle or aponeurosis and a posterior or shorter crust which is attached to the iliopubic tract. Now, what is the iliopubic tract? It is an aponeurotic band which is mainly a thickening of transversalis fascia but it also comprises of the transversus abdominis aponeurosis. It varies in literature. So, the iliopubic tract extends between the anterior superior ilex spine to the inner lip of wing of ilium. Now, this iliopubic tract forms the inferior margin of most anterior repairs. There are two reasons for it. One, the risk of injury to the important vessels, the deep circumflex iliac vessels that lie below it, and also a risk of nerve injury and the important nerves lying in relation to the iliopubic tract are femoral nerve, lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, and the genital femoral nerve. So it is very important while applying tackers in laparoscopic hernia repair that we ensure it is above the iliopubic tract and not below it. Coming to the ligaments inguinal ligament or the Poparts ligament which is the inferior edge of the external oblique aponeurosis. It extends between the anterior superior iliac spine to the pubic tubercle and this is this upturns to form the inguinal canal and therefore it forms the inferior wall of the inguinal canal. Then we have the lacunar ligament or the Gymbanath's ligament which is a fan shaped medial expansion of the same inguinal ligament and this inserts into the pubis and it, this forms the medial border of the femoral canal which we'll discuss later and this lacunar ligament has a very important structure in relation to it which is an abnormal obturator artery this is a branch of the inferior epigastric artery normally um, this obturator artery arises as a branch from the internal iliac artery but an abnormal obturator arises from the in inferior epigastric artery which most commonly overlies the lacunar ligament so we should be careful during inguinal dissection that we do not injure this vessel. Then we have the pectineal ligament or the Cooper's ligament which is aponeurotic tissue along the superior border of the pubis. This forms the posterior border of the femoral canal and it is an important anchor in laparoscopic hernia repairs. This is a pictorial depiction of the ligaments. This is external oblique aponeurosis. The opening in it is the superficial inguinal ring. Here we can see the reflected part of the inguinal ligament. Here we see a fan shaped medial expansion of the inguinal ligament, which is the lacunar ligament of Chimbanat. And further posteriorly and medially, we have the pectinal ligament of Cooper. This is again inguinal canal where we see the superficial ring in the external oblique aponeurosis, a deep ring in the fascia transversalis and the cord which is traversing the inguinal canal from the deep to the superficial rings. And there we see the important vessels that lie in relation to it is the external iliac vessels and the branches from the external iliac vessel which is the inferior epigastric vessels. So coming to the contents of the inguinal canal, as we know, it's a spermatic cord in males and the round ligament of uterus in females and common to both sexes is the genital branch of genital femoral nerve and the ilioinguinal nerve. So coming to the femoral canal, this femoral canal is the middlemost compartment of the femoral sheath. It houses only the lymph node of locket, but the boundaries are important. Laterally lies the femoral vein, medially we have the lacunar ligament. Anteriorly, we have the medial half of the inguinal ligament and posteriorly, we have the conjoint tendon and the Cooper's ligament. So, we see that this femoral canal is a site for the occurrence of femoral hernia because the length of this canal is 1.3 centimeters. It lies in the anterior thigh. 
Coming to the surface markings of inguinal canal, the deep inguinal ring can be easily located 1.2 centimeters above the mid inguinal point. This mid, mid inguinal point is the midpoint between the pubic symphysis and the anterior superior iliac spine and the superficial inguinal ring is 1 centimeter above and lateral to the pubic tubercle. And joining these two rings, we have the inguinal canal, which can be marked as two parallel lines, one centimeter apart. The length of the inguinal canal being 3.75 centimeters to 4 centimeters. A very important concept recently developed is a myopectinal orifice of Fruchot. This was given by Henry Fruchot in 1956. According to him, this is the area of weakness in the pelvic region. And the factors which are predisposing to this area of weakness are the normal anatomic gaps which are located in this area in the form of the superficial ring, deep ring and the femoral canal. And also the aponeurotic nature unlike the rest of the abdominal wall which is uh, bounded by the thick abdominal wall musculature, this area is just a comprise, uh, this area just comprises of the muscular aponeurosis just contributing to the weakness in this area. Now this weakness has been further magnified by the bipedal nature of humans during the course of evolution and which is why this is the area that hernias tend to occur. Now this myobacterial orifice of Fruchot is bound, has got boundaries. Medially it is bounded by the rectus abdominis, the lateral border, laterally by the iliopsoas muscle, then inferiorly by the pectin pubis and superiorly by the arching fibers of internal oblique and transversus abdominis. Now this is obliquely divided as we can see in this picture by the inguinal ligament into a superior supra-inguinal compartment and an inferior sub-inguinal or femoral compartment. This is again further description of the myopectinal orifice of Fruchot. Here we see the inguinal ligament dividing the myopectinal orifice into a supra-inguinal and sub-inguinal parts and we have this is the region of the femoral canal through which a femoral hernia can occur and if we see posteriorly the area of the deep ring and the superficial ring which is not visualized here is where the hernia defects can occur. This is a diagram taken from Schwartz which shows the myopectinal orifice with all its boundaries are described medially the rectus, laterally the iliopsoas, inferiorly will be the pectin pubis and superiorly by the arching fibers of internal oblique and transversus abdominis. And here we see is a deep ring which lies in the myopectinal orifice and in the second diagram we can see again here is a superficial ring through which the direct hernia occurs due to a defect in the anterior abdominal wall musculature and here we see is the area of the femoral canal through which femoral hernias can occur. Another important concept is the Hesselbach triangle, which is bounded superior laterally by the inferior epigastric vessels, medially by the lateral border of rectus abdominis or the rectus sheath, and inferiorly by the inguinal ligament, medial half, and the Cooper's ligament. Hernias which are occurring in the Hesselbach triangle or medial to it are direct hernias, while hernias that occur lateral to it are indirect hernias. Coming next to the corona mortis or the circle of death or the crown of death. Now this is a very frequent anatomical structure that we that surgeons encounter. In cadaveric dissections it has been found that more than 80% of cadaveric dissections this structure was found. It is an important vascular anastomosis that lies in the retropubic region that varies in distance from between 40 to 100 millimeters behind the pubic symphysis. And this is comprised of major vessels like the common iliac, here in this picture as we can see is a common iliac and then the external iliac and the internal iliac which arise at the bifurcation. Normally the inferior epigastric is a branch from the external iliac and this can give rise to as we have discussed previously an aberrant or abnormal obturator artery while normally the obturator artery is a branch from the internal iliac artery. So a vascular anastomosis between all these structures is what forms a corona mortis which lies in the retropubic region just behind the superior pubic ramus and this is not uh, very prone to injury but once the injury occurs the bleeding is very difficult to control. Coming to the nerves of the inguinal region, there are five major nerves that need to be discussed. They being the iliohypogastric, the ilioinguinal, 
the lateral cutaneous nerve of thigh, the femoral nerve and the genitofemoral nerve. In this picture, we see lateral most at the point of origin is ileohypogastric and ileoinguinal nerve. Then we see the lateral cutaneous nerve of thigh which actually emerges later below the inguinal ligament as a lateral most nerve. And then this is the femoral nerve and this is the femoral nerve. Now the ileoinguinal nerve root value L1 is at the maximum risk of injury in case of open hernia repairs. Now this ileoinguinal nerve will supply sensation to the medial aspect of upper thigh and also the mons pubis and labia majors in females and the upper scrotum and root of penis in males. Now ileohypogastric it shares a root L1 with T12 extra innervation. This ileohypogastric nerve can descend in common with the ileoinguinal nerve or it can descend separately from the ileoinguinal nerve uh, supplying the lateral it, it has anterior cutaneous branch and lateral cutaneous branch it bifurcates and these two branches will provide sensation to the thigh. Then we have the femoral nerve of root value L1, L2. This has got genital branch and femoral branch. Accordingly, the femoral branch will supply the anterior thigh and the genital branch will supply the ipsilateral labium majus or scrotum. And then we have the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve which arises from the dorsal divisions of ventral rami of L2, L3 and this will supply the lateral most region of the thigh. And if this nerve is injured during the course of hernia repair, it gives rise to myalgia parasthetica, which is also seen in compression of this nerve. The clinical significance of the neuroanatomy in the groin region is a uh, very high incidence of chronic inguinal pain affecting the quality of life post hernia repair. And hernia surgery being such a common surgery, the incidence being as high as 6%. And the factors which can predispose to developing a chronic inguinodynia are the presence of preoperative pain, a younger age group uh, in case of open surgeries, and when we encounter postoperative complications. The chronic post inguinal pain is defined as a pain which lasts beyond three months post hernia repair. This is again a picture of cadaveric dissection, which is just to demonstrate the ileoinguinal nerve, which is the most commonly encountered nerve, the first nerve that we encounter on opening the superficial ring and the external oblique aponeurosis and which is at risk of maximum injury during an open hernia repair. Now we have already discussed the factors which can predispose to hernia. Now let's discuss the defense mechanisms that have been provided by nature against a hernia formation. One being the flap valve mechanism which is contributed by the obliquity of the inguinal canal as it extends between the external and the internal inguinal rings and as there is a rise in the intra-abdominal pressure, the roof and the floor of the inguinal canal oppose and thereby prevent any herniation. Next is the shutter mechanism which is contributed by the arching fibers of the internal oblique muscle as soon as there is a rise in the intra-abdominal pressure. Then we have the ball valve mechanism where we have the cremaster muscle plugging the superficial ring as soon as there is a rise in the intra-abdominal pressure. The slit valve mechanism is where the intercrural fibers that bound the superficial ring in the external oblique aponeurosis, they contract and they close the ring thereby preventing any hernia to descend. And also a protective mechanism is arching fibers of conjoint tendon. This is just a pictorial depiction of the open approach of hernia repair where we have given a curvilinear uh, groin skin crease incision and as we open the layers as we have discussed in the anterior abdominal wall first the skin subcutaneous tissue then the superficial fascia the campus fascia and followed by the scarpa's fascia here we have excised the external oblique aponeurosis and this is the external ring and here we can see the inguinal canal is exposed once you have excised the external oblique aponeurosis and there we see the contents of the inguinal canal This is the same picture which is showing how the ileoinguinal nerve, it is the superficial most nerve and its risk of injury. This is the external oblique aponeurosis which has been reflected and now we can see the internal oblique muscle and the aponeurosis. Okay. And further we can continue the dissection to 
because in different repairs that we'll discuss later in bassini and shoulders repair we have to cut through all layers and then do an imbricated repair of all these layers to strengthen the posterior wall of the inguinal canal the first diagram here shows a lichtenstein tension free mesh hernioplasty where we see a mesh has been placed with a fish tailing of the mesh and there is a spermatic cord fish tailing to accommodate the spermatic cord the second diagram shows bassini's repair where there is a complete reconstruction of the inguinal canal a three layer repair is done and the we see the all three layers uh, from deep outer out, outwards we have the fascia transversalis then the internal oblique aponeurosis the transverse abdominis uh, aponeurosis and the internal oblique aponeurosis all of which are sutured to the inguinal ligament and here is the shoulder repair in shoulder repair there is an imbricated repair in which a running continuous suture is taken from the posterior most layer to the anterior most layer thereby strengthening the posterior wall of the inguinal canal and here we see a cooper's ligament repair where the fascia transversalis is being anchored to the cooper's ligament coming to the laparoscopic anatomy of groin hernia now in laparoscopic hernia repair an important anatomical approach is from posterior to anterior rather than anterior to posterior which you have seen in open repairs now in laparoscopic anatomy there are several important intraperitoneal points of reference most important being the five peritoneal folds of plicae the median umbilical fold the two medial umbilical folds and the two lateral umbilical folds and this median umbilical fold is is the remnant of uracus which is derived from the allantois in the embryonic life this most prominent plicae that you will see while doing a laparoscopic hernia repair are the medial umbilical folds which are two in number on either side of the medial median umbilical fold and these two house the umbilical vessels and which is why we have to be careful uh, normally we say that the umbilical vessels are obliterated but in case they are patent troubles in bleeding can occur from the medial umbilical folds and hence these should not be cut and then we have the two lateral umbilical folds which are actually the inferior epigastric vessels that lie in the lateral umbilical folds and then we have the urinary bladder the inferior epigastric vessels and the psoas muscle then the two important spaces in laparoscopic hernia repair are the space of bogros and the space of retsius the space of bogros is a preperitoneal space comprising of fat and areolar tissue this is lying lateral is a lateral space in laparoscopic hernia repair while space of retsius is a medial most preperitoneal space that lies just superior to the bladder now this is a diagram showing the posterior to anterior anatomy as is relevant in a laparoscopic hernia repair here we see this is the medial end and there's a lateral end and so we are seeing the right groin here and here we have the superficial ring there we have the deep ring where we see the cord structures that is the vas deferens and the gonadal vessels entering the deep ring into the inguinal canal and here we have the external iliac vessels from which arise the inferior epigastric vessels here we have the pubic tubercle which is the median most point this is a diagram of the laparoscopic view of hernia repair where we find the three fossa that we just described like the fossa vesicalis most medial most followed by the fossa medialis and the fossa lateralis the fossa vesicalis is one that lies superior to the bladder which is a medial most area that lies between the median and the medial umbilical folds the fossa medialis is one that is lying medial to the medial umbilical fold and the fossa lateralis is one that lies lateral to the lateral umbilical fold and between the iliopubic tract and the lateral umbilical medial umbilical fold this is again a reinforcement of the same this is the median umbilical fold but as we see the most prominent structures are the medial umbilical folds which house the 
umbilical vessels which may be obliterated or patent and then we have the lateral umbilical fold which house the inferior epigastric vessels. And here is a triangle of two which we will describe later in detail. Here we see the vas deferens which form the medial boundary of the triangle of two and the conoidal vessels which form the lateral boundary and here the apex being formed by the deep inguinal ring. Vascular plane is between the two lamina, the anterior and posterior lamina of fascia transversalis. Now we have seen that ileo-inguinal nerve is the most commonly injured nerve in case of open hernia repair. But in case of a laparoscopic hernia repair, nerve at maximum risk of injury is the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve in about 50% of cases, followed by the femoral branch genitofemoral nerve in about 30% of cases. Now trapezoid of disaster is the triangle of two combined with the inverted triangle of pay. Now coming to the triangle of two, the apex of this triangle is formed by the deep inguinal ring, the medial border is formed by the ductus deferens and the lateral border is formed by the gonadal vessels while the inferior edge is formed by the peritoneal reflection. And here we can see all the contents of the triangle of two which is why it is known as the triangle of two because we have to be careful during dissection that we do not injure any of these structures which are the external iliac vessels, most important structures and the deep circumflex iliac vein, the femoral nerve and the genital branch of genital femoral nerve. Then we have the inverted triangle of pain which combined with the triangle of two forms the trapezoidal disaster because here the nerves are at maximum risk of injury. Here, the inferior lateral border is formed by the iliopubic tract, laterally is the reflected peritoneum and superior medially lie the gonadal vessels. And as we can see, all the nerves, the femoral nerve, the thickest nerve, and then we have the femoral branch, the femoral nerve, and the anterior femoral cutaneous nerve and the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. This is a picture taken from our, one of our own patients in drop. Laparoscopic anatomy has been shown in great detail here where we see this is the bladder and the median umbilical fold. This is the most prominent medial umbilical fold and lateral to it is the lateral umbilical fold which, which is not very prominent over here but what has been marked as inferior epigastric vessel that is what is supposed to be the lateral umbilical fold. Here we see the deep ring and here we have this deep ring is supposed to form the apex of this triangle tomb and this is the vast deference that lies medially and these are gonadal vessels. Taking both sides into view, again the bladder, the median umbilical fold, the medial umbilical folds and the lateral umbilical fold which is not very prominent structure, it depends on the body mass index of the individual, how prominent it is, housing the inferior epigastric vessels and here we have the deep ring and as we have described the cord structures and the vast deference. Now coming to a video showing the laparoscopic landmarks. The important landmarks, the first landmark that we'll encounter is the Cooper's ligament which is supposed to be the which is known as the lighthouse of the groin. Here we see this is the Cooper's ligament okay. and then we continue our dissection. Here we see the inferior epigastric vessels. Here the lateral umbilical fold is somewhat prominent and hence it is easier to identify the inferior epigastric vessels. And then we see the iliopubic tract here which is as we described the intersection should not extend below the iliopubic tract. It should be the especially application of tackles should always be above the iliopubic tract. Then we come to TEP or the totally extraperitoneal repair. Here 
uh, the extent of dissection superiorly is up to the sub umbilical area, inferiorly up to the space of redsius, inferior laterally up to the psoas muscle where we can identify all the nerves and medially is beyond the midline. In this video, we will see a direct effect. Direct effect is one that lies medial to the inferior epigastric vessels and how we identify the medial uh, epigast uh, the inferior epigastric vessels is by the lateral umbilical fold. Here we see the Cooper's ligament and as we are dissecting, this is a defect which lies very medially just above the Cooper's ligament and we are trying to reduce the sac, reduce the contents of the sac and it has been successfully reduced. Slide show. Okay. Here we will see an indirect effect which lies lateral to the inferior epigastric vessels. Here we can see the cord structures. In cord structures will lie the vessels and the vas deferens. As we continue the dissection, we separate the vas from the other cord structures. And we are trying to reflect the peritoneum away from the cord structures in the vas. So that when we place the mesh, there should not be any peritoneal content that lies in front of the mesh. The sac may be transected if required. And one thing to be kept in mind is that we should not hold the vas deferens directly. It can only be, it should not be grasped directly, it can only be retracted because an injury to the vas is equivalent to a vasectomy. So here we see we have defined the triangle of doom, this is the Cooper's ligament and here we have the vas deferens, the gonadal vessels, apex of the deep ring and there we see the pulsations of the external iliac vessels. I am showing videos of lateral and medial dissection. Here we see the Cooper's ligament which is actually the most prominent uh, structure that we see in laparoscopic repair and rightly described as the lighthouse of the groin region. Here we see the pulsations of the external iliac vessels. Coming to the lateral dissection, lateral dissection should extend till the psoas when you can identify the nerves on the psoas. Here we see the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve that normally lies at the lateral edge of the psoas muscle and we have the genitofemoral nerve which lies on the body of the psoas muscle. This is again a laparoscopic view of the nerves. Here with the genitofemoral nerve and on the lateral border of the psoas muscle, we have the lateral cutaneous nerve of thigh. Coming to the mesh placement. So once we have created the space for the placement of mesh, after identifying the important landmarks and keeping all the nerves and vessels safe, so we place the mesh. We normally place a part heavyweight 3D mesh where the M lies medially and it should overlap the pubic symphysis at least so that there is no medial occurrence. And here we see a tacker fixation of the mesh 
this tack of fixation should occur above the ilia pubic tract because of injury to the risk of injury to the deep circumflex iliac vessels and the nerves that lie below the ilia pubic tract. Now this is a picture uh, of TAPP, robotic TAPP where we see a direct defect. We can identify it is a direct defect because we can see this is a bladder here and this is a prominent medial umbilical fold. We have not encountered the inferior epigastric vessels and this defect lies medial to it. So it is a direct defect and we can see this is a view of both sides. The contralateral side has no defect and here we see a defect. Now the dissection has been done with the delineation of the triangle of tomb. And once sufficient space has been created for the placement of mesh after creating a superior flap and an inferior flap, the inferior flap is created so that the mesh does not roll over. We place the mesh. Now in conclusion, an in-depth anatomical knowledge is very important for a successful hernia repair given the high risk of recurrence of about 10% even in laparoscopic hernia repairs. In spite of knowing concepts of myobacterial orifice of Frouchard, we have such a high recurrence and hence we need a further thorough anatomical knowledge. And the major landmarks that we must keep in mind, especially in a laparoscopic repair, are the inferior epigastric vessels, the Cooper's ligament and the iliopubic tract. Now, identifying and knowing the correct facial architecture is very important for identifying the correct plane of dissection so that tissue damage is minimized to the least and also the pelvic floor that is created for mesh implantation is, is quite efficiently made and the ease is better of mesh implantation once you identify the correct facial planes and the dissection is such that the risk of nerve and vessel injury is reduced to a minimum. So with this I conclude today's seminar. Thank you for watching. Thank you.